Thank you, everybody, and good morning. Uh, good morning, good morning. It was a very warm welcome that I received yesterday. In fact, it was a perspiring welcome uh, here in Dayton. It's almost as warm in Boston, but not quite. And speaking of Boston, I feel very much at home because I'm a Boston Red Sox fan, and you're probably all Cincinnati Reds fans. So at least we have red in common. <laughs> And I think pretty diffident baseball teams or temperamental baseball teams, even miserable baseball teams at times. In fact, being a Red Sox, I find being a Red Sox fan builds faith. It builds courage, builds character. I mean, it doesn't take faith, really, to be a Yankee fan. Really. I mean, the best team that money can buy. Why would you need faith to be a Yankee fan? But a Red Sox fan, and maybe even a Cincinnati Reds fan, this takes real faith. And uh, let's all hope we have the faith uh, remaining. In fact, I find a lot of similarity between being a Red Sox fan and being a Catholic at this point in time. There's a great deal of parallel emotions that go with it up and down, and you win some, you lose some, and then you're about to give up and you start winning again, etc. So it's a kind of a, a, a roller coaster. I'm delighted to have this. I was sitting there, back there during the prayer time thinking how privileged I am to have this kind of time with your kind of people and to be able to spend a day with you, to share a little with you, but also learn from you as the day unfolds. It's marvelous to reconnect with old friends, and I use the term old in the Irish sense of endearment. Not chronolo it's not a chronological report that I'm making now, but uh, uh, Dr. Karen Risto and uh, Tony Moore, uh, Dr. Angela Ann, the indomitable uh, Angela Ann Zakowski. Angela Ann and I were, were comparing notes. She was hired here 34 years ago, and I was hired at Boston College 36 years ago. So we are similar vintage. In fact, I was hired just after I made my first Holy Communion, and she was hired. <laughs> I think Angela Ann had actually made her confirmation when they hired her, but maybe not. Maybe just of Holy Communion. And, uh, but what a great blessing it is. And then to meet new friends like uh, Dr. Kelly and uh, last night over dinner and uh, Dr. Dave uh, Pohl and uh, Susan Ferguson and all the great people who have organized this wonderful day for us. And what a promising and uh, rich day it will be. Um, I just want to make an opening comment. I can't resist, really, when, I, when there's a beautiful prayer service like what we've just been through, I can't resist making, making a comment. Uh, well, let me tell a story first, that lovely focus on the Holy Spirit. I've been rereading the life of Pope John XXIII, that wonderful, marvelous pope that launched the Second Vatican Council and the, the extraordinary renewal and reform that the Holy Spirit brought to the church by that great council. So Pope John, for all of us, is still such a symbol of hope and so on, but he was, he was a man of he had great, he had a great sense of humor, which I love about him, because I think people of faith should have a sense of humor, because you know that you're not God. And when you know that you're not God, then I think you can afford to laugh and to take a Sabbath and you know, to have a little time off and to, you know, a bit of mirth in your life, because if you really believe that God is your God, I think then you'll be very funny. Uh, and life will be fairly funny as well. So, uh, but he, he, uh, he, he loved to drop in on people, which, you know, being the Pope, <laughs> that was a little complicated, but he was going by the Hospital of the Holy Spirit in Rome uh, one afternoon, and he said to his driver, oh, let's drop in to the, it's a wonderful, famous uh, hospital in Rome, this Hospital of the Holy Spirit, run by the Sisters of the Holy Spirit. So sure enough, they stop at the hospital, and of course, consternation breaks out in the hospital. The Pope is at the front door, wants to come in, and they, you know, the, well, we weren't expecting him. Yeah, but he's the Pope, you let him in, it doesn't matter. So the superior of the uh, Holy Spirit community went down to the front door, and of course, was a little flustered and flummoxed, and said, Your Holiness, we're delighted to have you. And he said, and, and, and who are you now, sister? And she said, well, actually, I'm the superior of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And she said, well, then he says, you outrank me because I'm just the vicar of Christ. <laughs> Anyhow, that, that lovely prayer service and the, and the beautiful reading from Acts chapter 2 of Pentecost, it's a powerful reading for us, but I want to go back to Acts chapter 1 verse 15, because the, this, the, the event of Pentecost, which of course la uh, launched our beloved faith upon the world and our church upon the world, that we so often see it represented, especially in the art, in the classic art of the Christian tradition, very often Pentecost is represented as the Holy Spirit descending upon the 12 apostles. 
and it states very clearly in the Baltimore Catechism, I reread it two weeks ago for a course I was teaching, that the Holy Spirit descended upon the 12 apostles. Well, now that's true, but then that's not true at all. Because if you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 15, it says very clearly there were 120 people in the upper room, including the women disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus. So there's 120 people in that room, a little few, few less than what we have here right now. And the Holy Spirit, then you pick up Acts chapter 2, and it says, and the Holy Spirit descended upon all there present. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a kind of a subversive memory for us. But for us, it's also an enlivening thought because it means that we too have received the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit did not simply descend upon the leadership of, the, of our church. The Holy Spirit did, of course. But the Holy Spirit descended upon all there present. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's a good memory to keep alive and it gives us hope, but it also, of course, gives us great responsibility. As we begin to think about imaging, the future for Catholic education. I was reminded that the psychologists tell us this, where do we get our images uh, in life? When we start to imagine, where do we get our images? Well, the psychologists tell us that we get them from the well of the memory, that the images come from the memory. Now, the images that come from the memory cannot simply be a rerun or a repeat, but they become a source. They become a source for imagining. There's a wonderful text, it's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 51, where Jesus says that the scribe learned in the reign of God, I think that's a great description of a Catholic educator, a scribe learned in the reign of God, is like the head of a household who can take from the storeroom, and some translations have from the treasury, both the old and the new. So in a sense, our task as stewards of this extraordinary tradition of Catholic education, now 2,000 years young, and don't forget that. It didn't just start in this country in 1884 when our bishops of the Third Council of Baltimore decreed a Catholic school for every parish. This goes back to a hillside on Galilee, Matthew chapter 28, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. That's when Catholic education began, and it's gone now for 2,000 years. Um, but in that, in that, in that great 2,000 year tradition that is ours, as we as good stewards of that tradition, as we begin to imagine our future, we'll be well served by dipping into the well of the memory. And in large part, that's a lot of what I'm going to do uh, together this morning uh, for the time I have with you. And then if I don't get it all said, um, uh, I'll say a little more, I think, this afternoon. Um, or you could uh, buy one of those books that uh, Dr. Kelly uh, graciously have a little 11-year-old boy who is constantly in need of new shoes. And uh, so if you want to contribute to Teddy's Shoe Fund, you could buy a book. Or you could just wait for the movie, whichever you want to, whichever. Um, <laughs> So we're going to dip into the well of the memory and, and uh, see what we find there by way of envisioning a new future for Catholic education. And I've crafted my comments around this, this, this uh, kind of a dual emphasis that Catholic schools are to educate from a faith perspective, and of course they're to educate for a faith perspective on life as well. In other words, this whole school educational system that we cherish arises out of deep faith convictions. And the curriculum of our schools should faithfully reflect and implement those faith convictions. Otherwise, they're not Catholic schools. So it arises from faith, but it is also to lead to faith and encourage faith and to encourage people in the living of their faith, as Dean Kelly said. That there's a great line in, in um, Gaudium et Spes, the Constitution of the Church in the Modern World, paragraph 43, an extraordinary statement where it says that the worst, the biggest heresy of our time is, now they're writing in 1965, and you think they would say communism, materialism, individualism, consumerism, or something like that. No, it says the worst heresy of our time is the gap that Christians maintain between the faith we profess and the lives we live. Uh, so th the challenge to constantly integrate life and faith, it'll be my closing theme this afternoon, uh, is, is indeed part of the mandate, the mission 
of Catholic education. And that people who come into our schools, and increasingly we have people coming in from diverse backgrounds into our schools. I know personally, and I visited a Catholic high school in Chicago that has 89% of its student body is now from other traditions than Catholic. And so as students come into our schools, they should all, we still must educate them for faith. Even if they don't, and, and we do, should not indeed proselytize or manipulate or whatever uh, th them into becoming Catholic, but yet their exposure to a good Catholic education should encourage them to become people of great faith in the midst of the world. If we don't give them a faith perspective if they leave, if they, as they leave us, if we haven't enhanced the faith that they brought with them as they leave us, then we have not given them a good Catholic education. So we educate from faith and we educate for faith. And in a sense, the, the, uh, the, my comments will be, um, will be crafted around both of those themes. As I said, the last words that the risen Christ uh, gave to the disciples, at least in Matthew, chapter 28, on that hillside in Galilee, when he gathered his little remnant community, was to go, to go make disciples. In fact, the whole text reads, uh, all authority on heaven and on earth have been given to me. What an amazing statement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Mathetes is the Greek verb there, to make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, take them into community, into a community of faith. Teach them. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. In other words, teach them this great moral code, this great ethical vision that of, of God's reign that I have proclaimed. And then, of course, the great ultimate promise, know that I will be with you always until the end of time. Now, what happened in the first Christian communities was that a great debate broke out about whether the church should both evangelize and teach. Ah, uh, should it simply proclaim and teach the faith? Or should it also conduct educational systems for the common good? And it was a great debate. Tertullian, for example, a great Christian author of the early centuries, argued strongly that the church has no business being involved in secular or what he called general education. So yes, by all means, teach them the faith, teach them religion, but don't bother with reading, writing, rhetoric, uh, arithmetic, and so on. Uh, why be teaching them the, the, the Greek poets and philosophers and, and scientists and what have you? His great phrase was that Jerusalem has no need of Athens. In other words, we have the word of God in sacred scripture in Jerusalem. Why would we turn to Athens? And it was a big debate, and, but saner voices prevailed. Clement of Alexandria, for example, uh, Origen at Alexandria as well, uh, argued that to give a child a good education teach him the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic, etc. that to give a, a child a good education would always be, and I quote from Clement, a work of salvation. In other words, that to educate is to save souls. Uh, it's to save people's lives. Uh, indeed, we will teach them the faith, but we will also give them a good education. And in many ways, that was the position that won the day. The church decided to do both to indeed proclaim the faith and evangelize, but also to carry on an educational system. And of course, since then, the church, the Catholic Church, has been the largest, the most influential edu educator in the world. There is no agency, there's no government, there's no uh, state that has been more influential, more pervasive across the last 2,000 years and around the world than our good church in its efforts to educate. Beginning with the monastic schools, um, the, the Benedictine schools, but of course the Celtic schools were really the ones that got it started and saved civilization, if you don't, just checking to see is anybody still listening to me now. Uh, but uh, the Celtic schools, the monastic schools, and so on, of the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries, then leading on up to the cathedral schools of the ninth, tenth centuries, leading on into the founding of the great universities, all of the great universities, every one of them, uh, Bologna, Salamanca, Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, they were all founded by papal charter. 
and staffed by the emerging uh, vowed religious communities that were taking on a public apostolate. Uh, the Augustinians, the uh, Franciscans, the Dominicans, and then later on, quite a bit later on, the Jesuits and so on. Uh, so the great university. So in many ways, the whole intellectual educational enterprise of the Western world, certainly and indeed eventually of the whole world, because then you push on out into modern education and into mission education. Uh, into Africa and Asia and South America and the, around the whole world. The Catholicity of Catholic education is extraordinary. So in, in a sense, you have this phenomenal picture of what our church, out of a faith conviction, has contributed to the life of the world. Uh, and why wouldn't we? Uh, it's lovely. I always remember that text. It's in John chapter 6. Uh, verse 51, where he says that the, the bread that he's leaving us as his body and his, his, pre, his real presence is indeed given for the life of the world, not just for personal uh, aggrandizement or advancement or enhancement, but for the life of the world. So in a sense, this faith that we receive from this Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Christ, indeed has been extraordinarily for the life of the world. A 2,000 year commitment to educate from Catholic faith and from a faith perspective, and for a faith as well. Um, I think that, that, that uh, it lands a tremendous, this is uh, kind of obvious. In fact, you'll be wondering why Tony and her colleagues invited me, because some of the things I'm going to be saying today are so obvious. But in a sense, when you, when you posit a transcendent foundation, in other words, a God foundation, uh, for any educational system, I mean, that makes an extraordinary difference and should make an extraordinary difference. Uh, it lends, it, it, the, in other words, the whole system is grounded in a faith in God. And I won't have time to unpack all of this, but it's not just a faith in God as some kind of a nebulous character off out there. It's a faith in God who is revealed in Jesus Christ, who is a God who is, is love, as uh, First John's epistle puts it. And not only God is love, but God is in love with, it, with us, with me, with you, an unconditionally loving God and so on. But just imagine giving a young person and that basic conviction and outlook in life that God loves them unconditionally. Uh, and you tell them the great stories of the, the, the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son and all the other great stories that make that point. What a tremendous foundation. And then to raise up a, an educational system grounded in a conviction in a God, not, a, not a, 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 an angry God that holds a bunch of sinners in God's hands, but rather a loving God uh, and it, it, with, with basically good people in God's hands. Uh, what, a, what a powerful, positive perspective to give people in life. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, of course, and I'll come back by the end of the day at least to say that the whole, the gospel of Jesus Christ is our basic foundation uh, as, a, as a school system. And I'm not talking now just about the religion curriculum of our schools. And when you teach religion in your schools, I'm talking about the whole curriculum that it all has to be pervaded. Then by the Holy Spirit, indeed our, lo our lovely opening prayer service, that the Spirit is still at work in our world and that the Spirit has come upon all of us by baptism and then deepened and expanded in confirmation. And that the, indeed the Spirit is at work in young people's lives. And how do you draw in the Spirit? How do you engage their souls? How do you get them to draw upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to live into the gifts and the graces and the fruits of the Holy Spirit? If you take that seriously, that's as important in math class or science classes as it is in religion classes. If, and I'll come back to that too, what does it mean for how we would teach if you're confident that the Spirit of God is indeed within these young people? Uh, and this goes all the way back through our tradition. Augustine, if you have nothing else to do the next time you're in the library, take down a copy of Augustine's little text simply called The Teacher. It's one of the most inspiring pieces of reading you'll ever do. You may find it under the Latin title, De Magistro, but it's the teacher. And there he says, and they all already come to us with the truth within them. And we, 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 we encourage that truth. We draw out that truth. We inflame that truth. We bring that truth to explicitness and to articulateness and so on. We give them a language for the truth already within. But his wonderful line in there, he says, never send a child to school to learn what a teacher thinks. Send them to school to learn to think for themselves. This is Augustine writing the year 400, uh, 1600 years ago. So this is not new modern education. 
And you'll find the same thing in Aquinas. You'll find it in Bellarmine. You'll find it in, in Mary Ward and Angela Marici and the great mothers and fathers of Catholic education throughout the ages. Um, I think basically what our, our educational system does is it takes deep Catholic faith convictions and tries to put them to work, which of course is basically what a spirituality is. To me, spirituality is simply taking your faith and putting it to work. But we try to put it to work throughout a curriculum, throughout the whole curriculum of a school. And in a sense, it lends us not simply a philosophy of education, it lends us a spirituality of education. That what you do is not just simply out of philosophical conviction or clarity, it's done out of deep faith convictions and commitments. When I say that it's to permeate the whole curriculum, I mean it. Uh, because we often think of curriculum simply as what we teach, and indeed that's included. But what we teach, the content we teach, uh, indeed is integral to our curriculum and should be suffused by the deep convictions of our Catholic faith. But then why we teach it, the purposes, the learning outcomes, to what end we teach it, should be suffused by faith as well. Are we preparing people simply to make a living? Or are we preparing them to also have a life? And of course, you've got to do both. Ah, but I was at a, I was privileged, I'm name dropping now in case you missed this, but uh, I was privileged to be at a White House briefing a couple of weeks ago on higher education, what's emerging in our country. And the two presenters that we heard were all talking about training them. We've got to train them, you know, in technology, in engineering, in, in science, in math. We've got to train them, get, prepare them for jobs, prepare them for jobs, prepare them for jobs. We've got to train them. This is what higher education is about. We've got to train them. So I eventually stood up and I said, why don't we educate them as well? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good idea? Give them an education as well as a training? In other words, don't, don't just prepare them to, to, to make a living. Prepare them to have a life and, and to live with great values and outlooks and perspectives and commitments and convictions as well as skills that will get them a job. But my goodness, how impoverished we would be if we ever stop giving people a good education. So why we teach, to what end we teach, is, is part of our curriculum. Who we teach, and how we recognize their potential. What is their potential? What are their possibilities? And we have never, as Catholic Christians, we have never believed in predestination. Social or sociological or theological. In other words, regardless of where a young person comes from, it might come from an impoverished home, an underprivileged context, and, and a low economic situation. But they've got tremendous potential. We can turn lives around. A good education can still make an enormous difference in a young person's life. And if we don't see that potential in them and nurture and encourage that potential, then we're not giving them a Catholic education. It's to permeate who we teach. It's to permeate where we teach. The whole environment of the school should be suffused with these values. As I keep saying, not just the religion curriculum, but the math and the social studies and the science curriculum as well, but also the environment of the school, the community they find there, uh, the kind of the way discipline is administered and so on in our schools. Uh, the values of Catholic faith should permeate the whole affair. I was with a, good, a new friend yesterday uh, who's a judge in this part of the world and who said that he starts out his day uh, believing that these people to appear before him are basically good people who have done dumb things. Now that's, that's a very positive anthropology to bring to a day's work. Uh, basically good people who have done dumb things. Now you see, because you could, you could approach them as these are basically evil, bad people. Uh, and they deserve what they're going to get. In fact, the sooner we lock them up, the better. Uh, he doesn't believe in locking people up at all unless he has to. It was Tony's husband, by the way. Some of you may be guessing who, who was it. Uh, I tell a story at the beginning of my new book about a famous movie star that I met on a plane. And it's, it's, a, it's a good story. I might read it for you before the end of the day. But I've had letters, emails for me begging me to tell them, who was the movie star? Who was that movie star? I still haven't told anybody. But anyway, it was uh, uh, Tony's, uh, Tony's husband. Uh, yesterday as we chatted about it. And you see, that attitude, let me give another example, some of you may have heard it before. My little boy Teddy was in second grade at the time and um, 
he, there was a visiting teacher in, this, in his class. Mrs. Delaney was out having a baby, and uh, uh, that'll keep people home for a couple of weeks. And uh, <laughs> so they had an, a substitute teacher who was a young student teacher from Boston College. And the first day she came, Teddy and two of his buddies decided, wouldn't it be fun not to go back in after recess? So this young teacher went out with 17 kids and came back in with 14. And of course, she did what a young teacher might do. She panicked. And so she started you know, shouting, yelling, screaming around the, 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 the playground. And I said, Teddy, well, didn't you come out? They were hiding behind a tree. And he said, Dad, you should have heard her screaming. She was scary. I mean, honest to God, I wasn't going to come out and face that woman, you know, by God. So uh, eventually, anyway, they're found. And of course, the young teacher does what she should do. She marched the three of them off to Mrs. Niden, the principal. So Mrs. Niden, so I said to Teddy, what did Mrs. Niden do? Well, he says, Mrs. Niden put the three of us sitting in a row. And then he says, Dad, she walked up and down, up and down for about an hour. <laughs> it's about three minutes, of course. And then she looked at us and she said, you know, I think that you are three wonderful children. And that's why I'm so surprised. Now, why did you do what you did? But he repeated it verbatim for me after that. She told us, we first started out saying we are three wonderful children, but then wanted to know how, why we did what we did and what, what kind of consequence she th we thought she, we should get and so on. And, but I, I said to Colleen afterwards, you know, it, it's, it's, it's worth the tuition, really. It's a little Catholic school. If that's the kind of anthropology, if that's the kind of a sense of the person that reigns in that school, then it's worth the money. Uh, for Teddy to know when he does something wrong that he's still a wonderful person, and yet she held him responsible. Uh, she didn't just blow it off. They, they got consequences for what they'd done, as they should. But, but that whole environment of the school should be suffused with those kind of values. How we teach, the pedagogy, the approach we teach, I think, should be suffused with it. And as I said, I may get to say more about that by the end of the day. And I would propose to you that the more Catholic, the more truly Catholic, and I put it in quotes deliberately, the more truly Catholic our schools, I think the more likely we are to both serve the common good of society and to promote our Christian faith as well. Because in many ways, as I understand it, the vision that's emerging for Catholic schools is the extraordinary contribution we can make to the common good of society. Our schools originally, especially in this country, were founded in ra for rather defensive reasons, and understandably. The, the faith of our children was threatened by the kinds of subtle, implicit curriculum that was being taught in the public school system, very strong Calvinist values and attitudes towards life. And our bishops recognized that this public school curriculum, the values of it, were indeed inimical in many ways to Catholic faith, and so founded their own school system. In many ways, was to defend and preserve the faith of our children. I don't want to lose that purpose at all. And yet, our purpose and our time has surely broadened into serving the common good. Uh, many of our inner city situations, especially where public school education has often run thin, sometimes even broken down, the Catholic school has an extraordinary contribution to make. So, uh, but I think we will do both the contribution to the common good and to the promotion and preserving of our faith and the, the, the flourishing of our faith if the more Catholic our schools might be. Now, I meant to do this a lot sooner and I've been talking too much, so I want to bring you into the conversation. And my question to you, would you take a piece of paper and a pen if you have one, you've been provided a free pen. Isn't it lovely when you come to conferences like this, you get a free pen and a pad. Um, what I'm going to do for the next little while uh, is to, to, in a sense, begin to unpack, and as I said, it may take, I may need a little time this afternoon to complete the story, to begin to unpack some of the deep values that as we educate from Christian faith, is going to be my big, my big question, as we start to educate from the depths of Christian faith, um, where do we go to find those depths? So let me, let, I love the conversation that, the, that he had with the Samaritan woman at the well. He told her that there'd always be fresh waters, that, that the waters of this gospel would always be fresh, springing up to eternal life. Well, when you stop and think about it, when I talk about the deep waters of Catholic faith, what comes to mind for you? What do you think is some of the deep down, the streams of truth and value that have run, that have made up this great river of Catholicism for 2,000 years? When you think about the deep down waters, not the kind of more morning paper 
uh, type of issues, but the deep structures, the deep rivers of the tradition, what comes to mind? Write it down, please. Sorry to cut off good conversation, but the tempest always fugits. Uh, the time flies. Um, give me a sense, just a quick sense, two or three people maybe. Um, I think we can hear from our streamers as well, if they want to come in. Um, what, did, what occurred to you as some of the deep stuff that defines Catholicism? And then what would it mean for an educational system or school? Somebody give us a word or two on that. Here's yourself right here. Sure. Uh, one of the things that Matt and I talked about was uh, social justice. Social justice. The social justice emphasis should definitely be there. It's a rich part of the tradition. And if we're not doing it, in our, then our schools are not Catholic. But thank God we're doing it and doing it well by all accounts. Thank you. Another one. Community. community, yes, there definitely should be a deep commitment to community, to building community. Uh, Tony Bright and Valerie Lee and those researchers, the Catholic schools and the common good, this is one of their findings, that Catholic schools typically do very well by way of building community within the school, teachers, pair with parents, with alums and so on. And my answer is that they should be, because it, it should be part of the, of the school system, if we're faithful to Catholic faith. A great one. Another one, yourself. All students take part in God's love. All the message is available to everyone. It's available to everyone. Everyone's included. God has no favorites except us all. <laughs> we're all God's favorite children. And that the inclusivity of our schools, the hospitality, the welcome. It's interesting, the word Catholic, we always say, oh, Catholic means universal. And it's true, that's what it means. But that was Aristotle's meaning of the term. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch and then Augustine and the great uh, author, Christian authors who began to use Catholic uh, originally to describe the church, used it in its etymological sense. And katholos literally means all are welcome. Katha-holos, we get our word whole, but to include all. James Joyce in Finnegan's Wake puts it best. He says, Catholic means here comes everybody. <laughs> um, and it's the, it's the etymological meaning of the term Catholic. So to be truly Catholic uh, and to know that God's indeed in love with all God's people, as Jesus says in John 14, verse 4, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. Many mansions. Now, we have a wonderful home within God's family, our Catholic Christian home, but it doesn't mean that other people don't have a home, that the rest are all orphans. No. And in our Catholic faith itself calls us to a deep inclusivity and respect, etc. It's a marvelous aspect. Let's take one more. Yourself over here. The sacramental practices, absolutely. How many of you thought about the Eucharist this morning? Phew, how many of you are sorry now that you didn't think about the Eucharist? I mean, yeah, the sacramentality of it all is a rich, rich aspect. But you see, well, let me come back to my presentation or you'll rob me of all I was going to say. But it's a powerful one. But you see, when we hear sacraments as Catholics, we often think of church, the seven that we celebrate there, perfectly appropriate. But the seven sacraments are simply the high points, the tips of the iceberg to what in our Catholic faith believes is the sacramentality of life. That it's all sacramental. That God is always up to something in this life of ours. And that God is always outreaching to us and inviting us to respond to God's presence. And typically through the ordinary and the everyday, toward the life and the world around us. The sacramentality of life in the world, as Rahner talked about it, as the whole tradition talks about it. Which then, this is why we have the audacity to show up in our churches and to believe that our God comes looking for us through bread and wine and water and oil and community and lovemaking in marriage. The sacramentality of marriage is the act of lovemaking. Uh, because it, but they're just simply the high points of what in fact is the sacramentality of life, uh, an outlook, a certain way of looking, a certain way of seeing. I had a teacher in high school at a boys boarding school outside of Dublin, uh, Dublin, Ireland, not Dublin, New Hampshire, uh, <clears throat> Paris, way people say Paris, France, well this was Dublin, Ireland. Um, Joe Horn, Lord rest him. 
Joe was our science teacher and our religion teacher. He was an extraordinary science teacher. He was a miserable religion teacher. Religion class, you had to believe it. Yeah, write it down. Of course you can't question it. It's your faith. The church teaches. But then he'd come into science class. And Joe did more in science class to give us a sacramental outlook on life far more than he did in religion class. Because when we were, whether we were looking through a microscope or a stethoscope or, a, or a, listening through a stethoscope or looking through a, a, a telescope or whatever we were doing, doing experiments, he would say, gentlemen, look at that. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't that amazing? Isn't, you see the design in that. Isn't it gorgeous? Isn't it wonderful? Gave us a marvelous outlook. And very seldom used God talk in his science class. But when I think back, and where did I get a sacramental outlook on life? and I think I have been blessed with one. Uh, I do have the ability, at least on a good day, as Ignatius of Loyola put it, to see God in all things and in all people. I got it from Joe Horn, but not in his religion class. I got it in his science class. Dr. Groom? Yes. We had a couple of people online who wanted to comment. Please. Okay. Um, we had Lisa from the Diocese of Toledo. Lisa, welcome. Uh, discipline? and stewardship. Discipline Sorry. and stewardship. They're goodies. Sorry. I'm okay. glad you interrupted and brought us back to those. Okay. Discipline and stewardship and the good discipline and how it's mediated uh, and the good stewardship and the sense of stewardship for God's creation. There are powerful aspects of the kind of ethos that should be present. Give us the other one if you would. Kim would like to add um, free thinking versus guided truths. Lovely. Yes, free thinking. You know, we are, it, it, definitely. And you see, if you don't believe me, I think Kim is right. You say, free thinking in a Catholic school? They really can think for themselves? <laughs> Go back to the tradition. That's exactly what you'll find. Uh, Aquinas was totally convinced that unless people probe, analyze, question, his whole system of education was called the questio, the question. You begin with a question and you kick it around and you get the wrong answers and the right answers and you debate it and you discuss it and you discern it and then you come to judgments and decisions for yourself uh, to think for themselves. Now, we believe that we shouldn't just think by yourself. You should think with other people and in community. But nonetheless, that should people think for themselves, even about their faith, all of the great architects of the tradition would champion this value in Catholic education. It should never be a narrow-minded type of indoctrination of any kind. It is, it is a violation of the tradition to present it that way. Even Jesus constantly gave people choices. Uh, now, he definitely called them to discipleship, but the response always had to be free. Uh, anything less is unworthy of the gospel. Thank you for coming in, wherever you came in from. It's hard to <laughs> know where it comes from. Cyberspace, isn't it amazing? Let me push on, and I'm going to summarize a little bit. Just, just a little touch. Now, there's a whole ream of, of uh, aspects that I'm going to leave out. But, when, but I'm just going to re raise up four of my favorites. When you start educating from the depths of Catholicism, uh, what would be some of the implications? I would say that a curriculum of a Catholic school is to reflect an anthropology, <clears throat> in other words, an understanding of our human condition that all people are made and all people can grow in the divine image and likeness. It's Genesis chapter 1 and then Genesis chapter 2. Made in the image and likeness of God and then Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 that God breathes the breath of God's own life into Hadam, into the human one. And the human people become nefesh, become alive with the Spirit of God. That the blood coursing through our veins this morning is indeed the very life of God. This extraordinary conviction that is right there at the beginning of our faith, that we are alive by the life of God. We're made in the image and likeness of God. And if you don't believe the dignity, the, the, the grandness, the, the, the goodness of the human condition <clears throat> from the Old Testament texts of Genesis, then you have to come to such conviction, it seems to me, from the New Testament and from the incarnation. <clears throat> we believe that our God actually became one of ourselves in this Jesus of Nazareth. What an extraordinary claim we Christians make, that our God was among us as one of us in this Jesus of Nazareth. But how could God 
take on our full human condition if we were corrupt and evil and inherently sinful. Now, I don't have time to footnote all of this, but this was one of the great debates at the time of the Reformation because Luther and Calvin even more so were saying there were nothing but a mass of peccati, a mass of sin and corruption, totally fallen and corrupt. Uh, and then the grace of God comes in and saves us, you know, without, even though we're unsavable and un unacceptable to God, God covers over our sinfulness and ignores it because of the dying and rising of Jesus. So that was never the Catholic position. When the Catholic Church regrouped with the Great Council of Trent, it came back against that and said, no, we're capable of sin and capable of evil and destruction, but original grace always remained. We're originally graced. We're born. We have an aptitude for God to begin with. We're inherently, basically good people. We're, good, we're not sinners in the hands of an angry God, as the reformers would have it. We're good people in the hands of a loving God. That's a very different outlook on life. Uh, again, it comes down to discipline. It comes down to discipline. So a kid steals $5 from his parents' wallet, or you suspect he, he, he stole $5, uh, and you say to him, uh, now, will you be Calvin or will you be Aquinas in how you mediate this, this event? And you could say, oh my God, you're a thief already, seven years of age, and already you're stealing, huh? Son of a famous theologian, and here you are stealing already. You'll be such an embarrassment to the family. Or do you say, Teddy, I bet you'd never steal $5 from my wallet. And if you ever did, I bet you'd put it right back when you stopped and thought about it. I bet you'd put it back. And then you leave the room and you say your three Hail Marys. Uh, <laughs> Teddy put back the $5. It's a different anthropology. But, I mean, parents can think of examples like this all the time. But teachers, you do it a hundred times a day. You bring, and you may not have known this, but you bring an operative anthropology into every situation in which you go. All of the great movies about teachers over the last 20, 25 years, Mr. Holland's opus and to, to uh, uh, Dead Poets Society, uh, To Sorrow With Love, I'm dating myself, um, they were all about the teachers who went into a situation where there was a negative anthropology reigning and they insisted on the opposite. The opposite should be reigning in a Catholic school. They're all made in the divine image and likeness, and therefore we have to educate the whole person, get deep down into their souls, not just into their brains and heads, but into the deep heart's core, as the poet Yeats calls it, of each of them, developing their capacities to be for life, and not just for themselves, but for all. A second outlook we should give them is a cosmology. You didn't know about this, but this is part of your, this is part of your mandate. In other words, an outlook on life, cosmos that nurtures a positive, a positive outlook, tints their lenses with a, with a, a totally uh, in favor of, a world that is meaningful, a life in the world that is worthwhile, that in fact ultimately is sacramental. And if you take that seriously, then it calls for an education that, uh, that shapes people's outlooks and ways on, on life and ways of being in the world, their outlook on, on, on themselves, on others, on the world. It gets them to pay attention to take a look. It's often it's fun how often as teachers we say to students, pay attention. Uh, but this is get them to look and to see and to see the more in the everyday, to see the ultimate in the ordinary, to see the creator in the created order, to see the transcendent in the imminent. There's always more to life than meets the eye. A good Catholic education should help people to be looking for it, to be on the lookout for it, to be expecting to find it, because it's always there. It's giving them a kind of a sacramental consciousness about life in the world, and that it is meaningful, it is worthwhile, that we give glory to God just by simply by being alive. And it's, we don't have to earn it and deserve it and prove it and win it. No, it's gift, it's grace. It's all charged with the grandeur of God. And it's all charged with grace. That gra that, and grace is the Latin word for grazie, for free. It's, it's, it's free to respond to it. Every, every grace comes as a responsibility, or better still, a response ability, the, the ability to respond. But it's always, it's always gift. It would give them a sociology, 
a, a way of looking at, at community, a way of being in community, as somebody over here uh, remarked. And it's a tremendous central emphasis of our Catholic tradition, this emphasis on being church, on going to church, on bonding together as church, that you really can't be a Chris, Catholic Christian simply watching it on television that you have to show up and, and be there and be part of the community. Why? Because it's a communal faith. We're called to be the body of Christ in the world. Yes, we're all called to our own deep personal relationship with God, but we're also called into a community of faith. And, and we even carry it to the extreme of believing that this community never ends, that even death does not break the bond of baptism which is why we think we still have a whole communion of saints surrounding us. They can pray for us and pray with us. And then the souls, the ones that had gone ahead, that didn't rush home to God, as the Eighth puts it, uh, what about them? Well, we can still intercede for them and say mass for them and uh, do an act of love or charity for them. And eventually, they, they'll, they, they, they too will be ready to go home to God. Uh, and, and so this whole sense of community that I said even transcends the grave. But when you take that seriously and you bring it into a Catholic school, it has to have powerful implications for the kind of community then that you try to become. And then the Catholicity of it all, that it welcomes all. It's a form all people. Uh, and it forms people in concern and care without borders. That the people the far side of the world are just as much our neighbor as the people living next door. That whole Catholicity of the tradition is such a tremendous richness. It calls for a curriculum, <clears throat> a certain moral formation in personal values, but also in social values that ent en entices, nurtures, cajoles, whatever, people to become good people because that's who they're capable of becoming. Uh, they may still, even if they still do dumb things occasionally, they're still capable of being great people, good people, good citizens, and citizens of the world, uh, not just of the local situation, but citizens with a sense of bondedness with the whole human family, and of course a deep commitment to work for justice for all, and especially for those most in need of it, in other words, the poor. Let me push on a little bit and at least start the conversation. If, that's, if some of that is to what it means to educate from a faith perspective, how about educating for a faith? And let me lay out at least the beginnings of this and then leave you with a question and I'll re-engage the conversation with my colleagues uh, when we gather in the panel this afternoon. Religious education in Catholic schools, I suppose, is what I'm going to talk about for a little while. When we talk about teaching the faith, uh, and they're still, that's indeed an integral aspect of their purpose. A good question to ask is what faith? Now you could say, well, the whole Catholic faith, the catechism of the Catholic Church represents a contemporary articulation, a comprehensive articulation of our faith. And it's a wonderful statement. And indeed, I say amen to that. And yet, what spin will we give it? What's the emphasis? What's the, what's the central theme that should organize our educating in faith. What faith are we to educate for? And this may sound amazingly obvious, and yet I think it's worth saying, and especially as Catholic Christians, there's a whole new awareness emerging among us of the centrality of Jesus to our faith. Now, I think some of this may pertain to some of the struggles in our church, uh, because so often when, you, when Catholics think faith, they think church, when they think of their religion, they think church. In fact, I have a friend who tells a story that he loves to do a so play association of ideas at parties and, and family gatherings. And when he says, when he does it with religion, at least in New England, when he says United Church of Christ, people say congregational. When he says Baptist, people say Bible. When he says evangelical, people say Jesus. When he says Catholic, people say church. Our typical association with being Catholic is church. Our typical association of being Catholic should be Jesus. I think Jesus is by far the best thing we've got. And, uh, and, and we'll never have any better. And that's exactly how the Catechism puts it. The Catechism says very clearly, uh, paragraph 426, that our faith, the core, the ultimate heart of our faith is not the Bible, not the church, not the commandments, not the sacraments, not the dogmas, not the doctrines. Now, all of those people, all of those are tremendously important, constitutive of our, of our faith, integral to our faith. Don't go home and report me to your bishop saying that I said that the, that the dogmas weren't important. No, they're terrible, terribly important. And yet, the Catechism says, at the heart, we find a person, 
And I love how the Catechism puts it. The person of Jesus of Nazareth, the only son from the Father, because we need both. We need the Jesus of history, the guy that walked the roads of Galilee, but we also need the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the only son from the Father. That's exactly how the Catechism lays it out. The Jesus of history who walked those roads, preaching the reign of God's unconditional love, inviting a radical love of us, a love even of enemies, fed the hungry, welcomed the marginalized, and claimed to fulfill the freedom uh, promised in Isaiah 61, when he went into the synagogue at Nazareth, remember, in Luke chapter 4, where he says the Spirit of God was upon him and sent him to bring good news to the poor, liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Uh, radically, he found the most radical text Walter Brueggemann, a great Old Testament scholar, says when Jesus went near that synagogue at Nazareth, he looked far. And in fact, the Greek verb there is heurisko, which means he searched far. The, the translation often has it, he found the text from Isaiah. Well, he looked far it, of Isaiah 61. And it was the most radical social text he could have found in the Hebrew scriptures, in all of the prophetic literature, that this, this promise of the messianic age. And then said today this this promise, this, this text is fulfilled in your hearing. And then, of course, proceeds throughout the rest of his life. Claims in John to be the way, the truth, and the life. Um, I say, see Luke chapter 2. Go home and take a look at that for yourself. I don't take too much time if I digress with it. It's the story of Jesus being found in the temple by Mary and Joseph. Because you can say to yourself, where did he get these great values? Where did he get these extraordinary values? How did he know to have women fully included among his disciples? How did he know to, 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 uh, to talk about loving enemies? I mean, talk about kind of crazy ideas, loving enemies and doing good to those who hate you and praying for those who persecute you. Where did he get such a radical faith? Now, you could cheat. You could say, well, he was the son of God. Of course, that's true. But according to the dogmas of our faith, that's the, the, the divinity never suspended or compromised the humanity. In other words, he, and as the catechism says, he had to be taught. He had to be taught. Well, who taught him? Uh, Mary and Joseph taught him a lot of his values. Uh, he learned them the way we learned them. Now, he was also and had divine wisdom and so on that emerges into clarity for him as he grows into adulthood. But he wasn't lying in the manger there in Bethlehem saying, ga, 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 but really saying, wait till I grow up, you people are going to be so surprised. <laughs> in other words, he really was there as a baby, nor was he pretending to hang on that cross. He was really there for us. So the divinity never suspended the humanity. So then you say, well, where did he learn? The, 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 the text, when you go to it, I love it, because, because it says that he was a day missing. Now, if you, in other words, if you take his humanity seriously, and Joseph and Mary's humanity, take them seriously. I'll come back to his divinity in a moment. If you take them seriously, think about that, 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 that event, when they lose him. And the text says that he was already missing a day when they even recognized that he was lost. Now, can't you imagine the conversation that went on between Joseph and Mary? I thought he was with your people. I never said he was coming home with my people. You did say you were coming home with your people. And then they go rushing back into Jerusalem, and he's missing two more days. Now, this is their only son missing three days in a very dangerous city. And according to Luke's gospel, Mary walked into the temple, which she never should have done, cool as a cucumber, and said, Son, your father and I have sought you with anxiety. Now, I'll put my life on it. That's not what happened. Can't you imagine Mary charging into that temple, scooping him up in her arms, smothering him in hugs and kisses. Oh my God, are you all right? Are you okay? Oh my God, we're worried sick about you. Joseph, give him a hug. Are you okay? You're bleeding. Anybody give you Anybody touch you? Are you bleeding? Oh my God, do you have any food? And then Jesus, I think, made a kind of a 12-year-old boy remark. He said, Ma, you should have known where to look for me. Now, we're not told what happened next. But Luke's gospel says, and he went down to Nazareth and was obedient to them. I bet he was. That poor, that poor kid was so scared he didn't leave home again until he was 30 years of age. And then it says, and he grew. He grew in wisdom, age, and grace before God and all the people. Well, who grew him? Mary and Joseph. Ah. Uh, and, of course, parents will always remain the primary religious educators of their children. If you don't believe me, go look at the Magnificat. You'll see where he got his image of God. 
a God who puts down the mighty from their thrones and raises up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty-handed. She sounds like a left-wing uh, socialist or something. <laughs> but then we also need the Christ of faith. Uh, the Son of God among us is one of ourselves. We believe that by his life, death, and resurrection that he conquered sin, social and personal, even conquered death, now has lost its sting a ling a ling and with us always, always now, especially we believe in Eucharist as a real presence, a body and blood presence. And then, as Paul puts it, by God's abundant grace in Jesus Christ, it is possible for us to live as his disciples. Uh, for Catholic and Christian students in our schools, I think the central purpose of our catechizing, of our religious education, indeed of the whole educational system, is conversion. Now, this is for the Catholic and Christian students. Now, it becomes more complicated when people come in from other traditions that are not Christian, and indeed from some Christian traditions as well. But I think the central purpose is conversion to Jesus and to his way. And this is precisely what the general directory for catechesis says as well. And that's for the references that I have in your notes. The catechetical education must put people in communion and intimacy with Jesus Christ. The general directory for catechesis states that that's the final, ultimate, defining purpose of all of our efforts to educate in faith, to put people in communion and intimacy with Jesus Christ, to apprentice them to him. In other words, to make them apprentices, to learn from him, but not in a fuzzy, wuzzy, me and Jesus kind of way, but rather so that they walk in his footsteps. That's what it's for. Uh, it appeals to people that, that, that Jesus leads a, lends us a persuasive apologetic. And I think we need a renewed apologetic for our faith in our time. We've got an extraordinarily rich faith for all of the, of the struggles and problems and controversies surrounding our beloved church. Never lose sight of the fact that we've got this amazing Catholic faith. Uh, and indeed, all of us as church are responsible for representing it in the world. Uh, and the fact that there are sinners in our church, I find a great relief. It means that I'm welcome as well. Um, and yet, it has a tremendously persuasive possibility when we centralize Jesus at the heart of our educating, our education in general, but also our education in faith. It appeals to people's desires. It, 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 it makes tremendous good sense. It appeals to our reason. And it also appeals to the fruits, to the benefits of such a faith. Aristotle said that good persuasion, good rhetoric, appeals to people's eros, their desires, their logos, their reason, and their ethos, the fruits that it leads to in their lives. I think when we put Jesus at the heart and soul of our faith and of our schools, that has tremendous appeal. Imagine the extraordinary person I would be if I would ever faithfully, consistently follow the way of Jesus of Nazareth what he modeled, but also what he made possible to live. How extraordinarily loving, hopeful, faithful, compassionate, merciful, inclusive, welcoming, hospitable, kind, funny, confident, you name it. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't kidding. There is no better life than this life to follow in this Jesus of Nazareth. So what an extraordinary invitation we have and how persuasive it can be, I believe, I think religious education our Catholic schools should teach so that our Catholic students may embrace their Catholic faith as their identity, absolutely. Uh, but then others from other traditions or perhaps from a non-Christian tradition, I've taught many Muslim students, many J Jewish students, uh, Buddhist students, Hindu students at Boston College. I taught 27 years undergraduate uh, before I got a day job uh, that I'd love to get rid of. Um, but but uh, it can be done in such a way that they learn from it, that they learn from it for their lives, and that, they're there, and that it enhances their way home to God, whatever path they might take, that they be greatly enriched by it. I often say, we don't do it because they're Catholic, we do it because we're Catholic. Uh, and so if they come to our schools, they, sh they too should receive a fine Catholic education. Now, I'm going to leave you with these thoughts because I'm just out of time. And I'll come back, and, but let me at least put the questions up here if I can take, well, I've got another three minutes, I think. Um, just think about it and take notes from yourself. Maybe at the break time, you can have a little chat with a neighbor. From my rambling so far, uh, what are some of the implications of putting Jesus at the center of Catholic education? If you put Jesus at the center of the school, 
Um, not John Dewey or Ma Maria Montessori or Paolo Freire or any great educational philosopher, although they're wonderful people, but if you put Jesus there, what difference does that make? What are some of the implications? These are just questions and maybe we can begin the conversation uh, later this afternoon um, by some, some reflections on these. But I want you to be thinking about, because what I want to do is about another 10 minutes, and I'll keep it till this afternoon rather than going over time now. It's fascinating. Uh, Jesus was first and foremost a teacher, an educator. Now, we, we, of course, he was the son of God. He was the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He was, etc. But when the Gospels decide the historical Jesus, 150 different times they describe him as teaching. One of ourselves. He was a carpenter as well, of course, but uh, his public career was of teaching. Now, I want you to be thinking about this and bring back your wisdom when you come this afternoon or bring it through the day, maybe be talking about it. What is your sense of how Jesus taught? What was his overarching style, our way of being with people? Because that's basically what education is. It's a way of teaching. It's a way of being present in people's lives. What was his style of being with people? And we will look specifically at his pedagogy, which of course is writ large in the parables, but I don't want to give you too much or you won't come back this afternoon. But, uh, but what, when you think about Jesus the teacher, what do you think of as his pedagogy? And then of course, what can we learn from that? Let me use the last two minutes and just simply ask some responses, questions, comments, answers, objections, agreements, whatever is perking. Let's hear from two or three people. And maybe we'll give the stream people the first dibs this time. Can we do that? Uh, any of our streamers want to come in with a comment? Just, what did you learn in school this morning? <laughs> well, we wait for a streamer while we're waiting. Let me take a minute or two with you. Somebody have a thought, a comment, an insight, a bit of wisdom you want that's perking for you? Yourself, thank you. Just a moment, they'll get the microphone there. Thank you. Early Thank on, you had said, um, when you talked about the school in Chicago that was 90% non-Catholic, and you said we shouldn't be proselytizing them. Uh -huh. I guess I always wonder, why shouldn't we offer them the beauty of our Catholic faith? Oh, I'm, I'm totally agreement that proselytizing and offering the beauty of our Catholic faith are not the same thing. Proselytizing is telling them that they have to be Catholic, and if they're not Catholic, they won't be saved, etc. I mean, no, there, there's no indoctrination but exposing them to the richness of it, absolutely. And especially the ethical, but also the, the sacramental, the doctrinal truths of it. No, I'm totally, if you misheard me on that, or if I, mis, I misspoke on that, I'm glad you clarified it. Of course we expose them to the richness of the faith. And yet, we can't make it sound as if, we can always say to them, you see, proselytizing is telling other people what they should believe. Evangelizing is telling people what we believe. Do you see the difference? So our schools should definitely be involved in evangelization. We should make very clear to people and to students, whoever in our school, teachers, whoever, what we believe and share our faith with them. But we shouldn't be telling them what they should and ought to believe. So I can always say, I'm writing a high school religion curriculum at the moment and, and uh, uh, Credo, the Credo series from Veritas, wonderful series. I was a pause for station identification there. Um, but we're very careful to say, in our Catholic faith, this is, what, this is how we understand the Blessed Trinity. This is how Catholic faith teaches about the Blessed Trinity. But to say to them, and then you, then you say to people, now, what can you learn from that? Is there a something in the extraordinary doctrine that our God is a God of right and loving relationship, even within God's self? and always toward us, that God is this triune, loving relationship. Well, if we're made in the image and likeness of God, then, then you say, how do you think we should live our lives? And you can ask that to a Jew, a Muslim, a, a Christian, or whoever. But you can't tell them, and you must believe this, and if you don't, you're a bad person or something. Sharing our, we, we, as I said, evangelizing is telling people what we believe. Proselytizing is telling them what they should believe. Thank you. Another comment or something that I wasn't 
that I confused you on? Well, we'll, is there a streamer coming? Not yet. They're trying to compose their um, Well, we'll <laughs> be back. Now. I'll be back with you this afternoon with some great colleagues, and we'll engage in conversation together, so we'll have time then as well. So by all means, bring us back your wisdom and your insights. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. And really, my apologies to this distinguished panel, that, because we will hear from them in a little while. Uh, but the difficulty of inviting Irish people to do this type of thing and to give them a microphone especially, it's like an aphrodisiac to us. It's just, we just can't, we just go on and on. So it takes us longer uh, to say things than other people, and the Germans could say it a lot more briefly and clearly indeed than the Irish could. So my apologies to preempting some of the panel time. And uh, somebody said to me coming in, what a wonderful day, but I'm sure you're tired. How many of you are, are tired? A lot of people, no, not feeling tired. Well, I always feel this is the time of day when I get the most agreement uh, from people. Uh, yeah, I've had people agree with me permanently, you know, at uh, this time. So we'll be gentle and I'll enjoy, engage you in the conversation as much as we can. I can't resist the temptation. I was just at a wonderful presentation by Tony and Dave on leadership and principles and how to be a good principal. Reminded me of the story of the kid who didn't want to go to school. The mother knocks on the door and says, Johnny, time to get up, time to go to school. And the voice comes back, I'm not going to school today, Mom. She said, of course you're going to school. Johnny, Johnny, get up, you're going to school. Mom, I'm not going to school today. Why aren't you going to school? Well, the other the kids don't like me. Well, tough oats, you still go to school. Uh, well, the teachers don't like me. Well, too bad, you're going to school today. Well, the staff even doesn't like me. I don't care you're going to school. Why do I have to go to school? First of all, because I said so, and secondly, because you're the principal. Anyway, that wasn't the principle that Dave was talking about in the, in the uh, um, I also, as I begin, I want to say um, how embarrassed I am by my overheads, by my, uh, I, I was at Angela Ann's workshop this morning and I was uncomfortable the whole way through because she had these beautiful little angels appearing and disappearing and all kinds of things. So I'm going home to try to improve my my overheads, my, my PowerPoint. But in the meantime, hopefully, it's at least remotely helpful to what we are, what we're to, to, and it'll keep me on track as well. I was going to pick up with this question of how did Jesus go about it? Now, I don't want to fall into some kind of a biblicism as if we've got to do it the way Jesus did it. No, I mean, it's 2,000 years ago. It was a different time, a different climate, a different culture, uh, a different context you know, to be rambling around the roads uh, telling great stories and what have you when Angela Ann can pipe in people from Hollywood into her classrooms here and, you know, he's up on the side of a mountain shouting because he doesn't have amplifier, he didn't have PowerPoint and he didn't have PowerPoint like mine for sure. Uh, so it's a totally different world, different time, so we can't begin to say, oh, we've got to do it the way Jesus did it, kind of a false piety. On the other hand, there was something about how he went about it that even in our a digital age and engaging people in multiple varied ways and all the rest of it and our brains shifting because of these new ways of learning and all the rest of it, there is still something consistent con and, con and constitutive, uh, constitutive of our human condition that I think is perennial. And how he went about it, we can use, if, I think if he was among us, he would be the first to encourage us to use all of the technologies, anything we can use to help proclaim the good news of the gospel, Jesus would be totally in favor of. So this isn't a throwback at all, but it still raises the question, no matter how sophisticated or updated or technological you are in your representation, and you're making present again of this great faith of ours, what's the underlying approach? What's the basic pedagogy? that you're employing. And I think we can discern one in him. And I just want to do a few of its overarching characteristics. Um, I think he was constantly welcoming and inclusive. Now, I do a better job, and I expand on this in that book, Will There Be Faith? Um, but they're, they're outstanding distinguishing characteristics of his whole approach. Tremendously welcoming and inclusive. In fact, he was distinguished by his outreach and by his radical inclusion. The outreach was very unusual. The scripture scholars say that a rabbi in the world at the time would have waited for students to come to him. 
that he never went out looking for students, but instead he's out on the highways and the byways, the marketplaces, looking for disciples, calling people, inviting people, and totally inclusive in his invitation. In fact, if you look at Mark's gospel, we always take Mark as the most original, the earliest, and the most historical of the four gospels. In Mark chapter 2, they begin to complain about the kind of people he's eating with. He's eating with tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and all kinds of, of unwelcome and excluded people in the world of the time, and he's including them at the ultimate moment of inclusion, which is his table fellowship. And sure enough, end of Mark, they complain about it at the beginning, of, end of Mark chapter 2, they're complaining about it at the beginning of Mark chapter 3, they're plotting to kill him. And the scripture scholars say that one of the first reasons they began to realize that this guy was dangerous was because of the inclusivity of his community and especially in his table fellowship. One of the most amazing aspects, of course, of his inclusivity was his full inclusion of women as integral members of his inner core of disciples, and that was so from the beginning. In all three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, it's in Matthew 18, you can check it when you go home, uh, it says very clearly that the women at the foot of the cross on Calvary had come up from Galilee with him. In other words, we're there with him from the beginning. And if you take John's chronology, that means for three years, these women had been integral members of his core group of disciples. And of course, then Mark 16, verse 8 says, and he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. In other words, and she became indeed the Apostola Apostolorum. That was her title all through the Middle Ages, the Apostle of the apostles. She was the first apostle to the rest of the apostles. That extraordinary inclusivity that would have been amazing in the culture and the world of the time. You find it there in John chapter 4 when he's talking to the Samaritan woman. First of all, he shouldn't have been talking to a woman. He shouldn't have been talking to a Samaritan woman. But instead, he's explaining his whole gospel to her. And sure enough, it says in the text, we had never noticed this before until women began to read the scriptures as scripture scholars, uh, but the men never saw it. It's right there in the text. It says that the disciples had gone to the village to buy food. They came back and were amazed to find him talking to a woman. In the world of the time, it would have been so. In fact, there was an ancient, there was an old mosaic tradition that the, the rabbi did not speak to his own wife in public uh, and, and spoke, spoke to her within the home only as necessary. Uh, the Hillel interpretation of mosaic law was a little more stringent than some other interpretations, but that was a common sentiment. So for him to be, to be holding forth and explaining about the waters of eternal life and all this kind of good stuff to this Samaritan woman. He was both the sexism and the racism of his culture. Uh, he was rejecting them. Extraordinary inclusivity. A second aspect of his commitment, of course, deeply respectful of the learners. Uh, always intent to empower people as agents of their own learning, not simply as dependents or recipients uh, and you find it, again, I, just exigencies of time, I'll be brief here, but it's amazing how often he, he, in his works, in his miracles of healing, where he turned to the person and say, instead of saying, I have healed you, he turns and says, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Uh, the bleeding woman, uh, 18 years, uh, hemorrhaging, and she touches him, and of course, which made him ritually unclean. He should have recoiled from the woman. And instead he says, somebody's touched me, and then she comes forward and confesses, and then she knows that the flow of blood has stopped. And she says so, and he says, but she wants to thank him for curing her. He says, no, 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 your faith has cured you. The faith that drove you through this crowd, pushing your way, an unclean woman, and then the courage to reach out and touch me, or at least she didn't want to touch him, she wanted to touch the, remember, the hem of his garment. She knew that would be enough because she didn't want to touch his arm or his personhood if she, if she could avoid it. Uh, but he turns to her and says, your faith has saved you. The, the, the leper that comes back to give thanks, he says, your faith has saved you. The blind Bartimaeus, he says, your faith has restored you. This tremendous affirmation. And imagine, and one of my favorite texts of it all is, of course, Matthew uh, 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And it's very clear at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that he was addressing the crowds. Not just the disciples, the inner circle, not just the apostles, 
But the crowds, five, six hundred people, poor peasant people who couldn't read, write, uh, uneducated, simple people. And he's saying to them, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Go out, you have a light. Don't, you don't have to banish all the darkness, but you sure as heck got to put your light on a, bushel ba on, a, on a lampstand rather than under a bushel basket. Let your light shine to ordinary everyday people. And the great freedom that he gave people in their coming to faith. In John chapter 6, you've got the extraordinary time when the disciples come to him and they say, look, you've got to tone it down. There are many people leaving and will walk no more in your company, is the text in John. And he turns to the disciples and instead of saying, oh, you better go after them and tell them, come on back because they, they're in trouble if they don't follow me. No, he turns to the disciples. He said, would you also like to go away? <laughs> and I always hear Peter who answers for them and says, basically, Peter says, you know, we've thought about it. <laughs> Peter doesn't say, oh, no, no, we're happy as a clam right here. No, no, no. Peter says, we've thought, Peter basically says, well, but who, where would we go? You have the words of everlasting life. The rich young man who comes wanting to be, to be perfect, and he tells him, go sell what you have. He leaves. Jesus is sad, but he doesn't go running after him. The tremendous freedom and respect and empowerment that runs all through his modeling throughout the scripture, throughout the gospels. And then, of course, tremendous compassion and commitment to justice. In fact, the, the New Testament scholars do not agree on very, very much, but they do agree on this, that the defining feature of Jesus' public ministry was compassion, uh, and especially with a certain favor who those, for those who needed the favor most. In other words, the ones in most need, poverty of whatever kind. And of course, the works of justice are at the heart of his ministry, uh, his whole central teaching about the reign of God. The reign of God was both a personal and a social symbol, a spiritual and a political symbol in Jewish consciousness. And here he's every, almost every parable. He begins by saying the reign of God is like, the reign of God is like, the reign of God is like, and always pointing to the fullness of life that God intends by God's reign. And isn't it fascinating how he taught us to say the Lord's Prayer? Indeed, we are to pray for the coming of God's reign, thy kingdom come, but immediately we're to add, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God's will, a fullness of life, of peace, of justice, of wholeness, of inclusion, and so on, are to be done now. It's to be done now rather than simply for later in heaven. We don't have to worry about heaven if we do it here. Um, so tremendous features of his, of his whole style uh, I think education in Catholic schools should reflect his approach. Should, but now if you begin to focus particularly on his pedagogy, in other words, his, his precise teaching approach, uh, I don't want to use the word method because it's more than a method. It, it's an, indeed an approach. Um, and in explicit events, now again, it would, we could unpack all kinds of conversations. Nicodemus who comes by night, the woman at the well, and so on. But overarchingly, and especially you see it in the parables, you see this constant dynamic of trying to get people to take their lives and to integrate it into their faith with a lived faith. And I talk about it as bringing life to faith to life. Uh, it's a very simple formula. I've written huge big books about this that some of you may have had to read. Uh, my apologies, because it's as simple as that. What's it all about? It's about getting people to bring their lives to their faith, their faith to their lives. And you see it all throughout his public ministry. He never makes a statement about himself without saying what it means for us. I am the light of the world, John chapter 8. If you follow, if you live according to my word, you too will have the light of life. I am the light of the world, follow me, you'll have the light of life. I am the good shepherd, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. And it constantly goes back between what you believe about him and how you put it to work in your life who he was, and how we are to be as a result if we become disciples and apprentices to him. This constant attempt to, be, to bring people to a lived faith, to integrating life and faith. And it's fascinating, this is an aside, I see an awful lot of this going on even in contemporary curricula that are non-religious. Uh, Teddy's math books are, con and I'm struggling with seventh, fifth grade math at the moment, but uh, his math books even are constantly, you know, the kind of sums I had to do uh, we're just, you know, multiply this by that. And that. But now it's 12 baseball players on the team and the $5 each and the hot dogs cost this and how much change will you have and what percentage did they spend. But it's all integrating math with life. 
And so much of his social studies curricula and so on do the same thing. And what can you learn from this, etc.? cetera? It, it's, it's the whole, so in religious education, in faith education, ah, it's imperative, it seems to me. Anyway, let's look at how he went about it, this life to faith to life. He constantly engaged the everyday of people's lives. You see it especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the parables. The reign of God is like a bunch of fishermen uh, 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 sorting fish. The reign of God is like a, a farmer who went out to sow some seed. The reign of God is like a woman who lost a coin. And I always imagine him being in those contexts that when he told those parables, he was talking to a bunch of fishermen and women sorting fish down by the lakeside on a, a sunrise. He was talking to a bunch of farmers. He was talking to women at the well. The, the, the reign of God is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. He was talking to pearl merchants. It's like you know, a woman who lost a coin. Whatever it is, he was getting people to stop and to look at their own lives in the world and to begin to realize this is a part of the reign of God. What I'm doing is important. I mean, there's something extraordinary going on here. You're, you're in the reign of God right there sorting fish. But then, not only did he get them to stop and look at their lives, but he often turned their lives upside down and got them to see their lives in a whole new way, to reflect on their own realidad, as Paulo Freire, my great mentor, uh, would have said, to reflect on their own reality, but then often to see it very differently. So those fishermen there sorting the fish, and Matthew tells the story in Matthew 7, that you know, the little ones that threw back into the water, the dead ones that threw to the birds, the, the, the good ones that put in a basket to take to the market, but that was a subversive, interpretation because his listeners would have presumed that whatever the reign of God might be, we belong because we're the children of Abraham and Sarah. So by birthright, we belong to the reign of God. And he's saying, oh no, maybe not. There'll be a sorting. There'll be a sorting here. The first people to hear the good Samaritan, blown away that the that hated Samaritan stopped. The priest passes, the Levite passes, the Samaritan stops. Uh, you can take any one of the great parables. The prodigal son, people would have been amazed. That son had blown his, his, his birthright. He had, he had no right to come home uh, at all. And, and, and the father had no right to expect or hope he would come home. But instead, the father is up longing for the son to come home, on the lookout for the kid. And, 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 the, and the young fellow's coming back with an apology. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. But the old father, when you look at that text in Luke 15, the father goes out and embraces the son before he gives his apology. What a risk for the father. What an unconditional love of God. Why was the kid coming home? Maybe to get more money, to get his laundry done, whatever brings him home. Ah. And yet the father runs out and embraces, and then the kid says, oh, I'm not worthy. The father says, oh, kill the fatted calf. And actually the better translation is, kill the calf that we've been fattening. In other words, in the hopes that he might come home. Now the people, we, that stuff passes us by. We've heard it a hundred times. It's passe. We've heard a good Samaritan prodigal son. The first people to hear it, their world would have been turned upside down by it. And not only does he welcome the kid home, but he actually puts, he gives him a ring for his fingers and sandals for his feet, both symbols of promotion within the family. No wonder this older son comes home and protests and says, and of course, he has a right to protest. The father's generosity has been excessive. All that type of getting people to stop, to look at their lives, but then to reflect on their lives. And yet, so he began with people's lives, and yet he constantly brought them to the gospel, to the teachings, and taught them with authority. Uh, that's what it says in Mark, again, chapter 1, verse 22. Very early on, he's recognizing his teaching with authority. Now, what authority did he have? He had none. He had no official authority. He was not an officially ordained rabbi. He was not a member of the Sanhedrin. So his authority must have been the integrity of his own life, his own commitment to living what he was preaching. And that was extraordinary because he preached extraordinary things about, about loving enemies and all this kind of stuff. And yet he's accused of many things throughout the Gospels, <laughs> violating the Sabbath, not keeping the ritual, the dietary laws. He's never accused of hypocrisy, which is extraordinary. Which, so he, this integrity uh, and, and, and authority in his own life, but then he got them to bring it back to life again, constantly encouraging people to see for themselves and to come to conviction. And of course, as they came back from, the, from life to faith to life, he constantly invited them to decision to follow his way as disciples. Let me give you just one example, my favorite example, 
of this whole process. You see it throughout the public life of Jesus, this life to faith, faith to life. But no better place do you see it reflected than that extraordinary story on the road to Emmaus. And I'm just going to walk through it very briefly with you, and then I'm going to pause and we'll hear from our friends uh, in response. It's an amazing text. It's not unique at all. Uh, you could do it with the Mar Samaritan woman at the well. You could do it with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. But it's most explicit of all in Luke. And you find it again in Acts chapter 7, chapter 8, with the, with the Ethiopian eunuch story, uh, the exact same pedagogy, beginning with people's lives, bringing to the faith tradition, but then to encourage them to bring that back and to put it to work in their everyday lives. The story begins by saying, that very, it's Luke 24, that very same day, which is Easter Sunday morning, two of them, and the them refers to the disciples, are making their way to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles distant from Jerusalem, discussing as they went along all that had happened. In other words, they're talking about their life. Now, these people, you can presume, are traumatized. They're in deep pain, disillusionment, discouragement. They've seen their beloved Jesus crucified. Oh, my goodness. Crucified and hung on a cross to die. And they had hoped that he was the one. So they're, they're, they've lost their hopes. They've given up. They're running away. They're getting out of there before they get into such trouble themselves. The text says, in the midst of their lively exchange, some translations have intense exchange, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. Now that to me is the loveliest description of a Catholic educator. He joined their company and walked along with them. But they were restrained from recognizing him. They don't recognize him. Now the scripture scholars have spilled buckets of ink and trying to figure out why didn't they recognize him. And you, if we had the time now, you could guess at it along with the rest of us. You know, they were too distraught, they weren't expecting him, you know, whatever. The better question, the educator's question is not why didn't, they recognize him, rise, why didn't they recognize him, the better question is why didn't he introduce himself? <laughs> I mean, if I was the risen Christ, I would have jumped out of those bushes and said, hey, look, look, it's me. I bounced back, we're up again, hey. <laughs> he never tells them what to see but waits for them to come to see for themselves. And oh my goodness, isn't that the most difficult part of teaching? Uh, because it's so much easier to jump in and tell them. So he says to them, they were just restrained from recognizing them. So he said to them, what are you discussing as you go upon your way? In other words, what's going on in your life? And they turned to him looking sad. And one of them, Cleophas by name, said to him, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things went on there these past few days? I mean, where have you been? I mean, don't you know the pain, the dreadful things that have happened in Jerusalem? He said to them, what things? Now let's agree. Nobody knew better than he what went on in Jerusalem these past few days. So why is he asking these two distraught disciples to tell him their story? and their shattered vision. He wants them to look at, as Paulo Freire would say, he wants them to name their own realidad, their own reality. He wants them to tell their story, to share their shattered vision, which is precisely what they do. They said all the things that had to do with Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet powerful in the eyes of God and all the people, and our, our chief priest took him and had him crucified, and we were hoping we were hoping. He was the one who had set Israel free. Besides all this, some women of our group went to the tomb before dawn and they've come back with the story. They say they saw a vision of angels who declared that he is alive. Some of the men of our group went to the tomb, but they saw nothing. And basically, we're out of there. Now, what do you have on the table? You have their own reflection on their own reality beginning with their lives, their pain, their trauma, their own garbled version of the Easter story, that their hopes were now shattered. He was the one who might have set Israel free. Now, so their life is on the table. And you can imagine him listening and probing and drawing them out and getting them to deepen the story and reflect on it and so on. And as I said, he could have told them things they never dreamt of, but he doesn't. But then it says, now it switches to the faith. Uh, he, get, he hears their traumatic story. Now it, f it switches to the faith tradition now. He retells the story and the vision of the faith community. 
And it's, the text says, beginning then with Moses and all the prophets, he interprets for them every passage of scripture that referred to himself and explained to them that the Messiah had to so suffer so as to enter into his glory. So he goes to the tradition, he, ta he takes out the texts, all the texts of scripture that referred to himself, no wonder they're on the road all day, uh, and then explains that the Messiah had to suffer so as to enter into his glory. So what you have now is a certain tension. They were hoping for a political Messiah the one who has set Israel free, he's talking to them about a suffering servant Messiah, that the Messiah had to so suffer. So there's a tension now. And yet, so now their own story and vision is on the table. The community story and vision is on the table. He still doesn't say, and hang it, open your eyes, it's myself, but instead. The text says, by now they're near the village to which they were going. He acts as if he was going on further, but they press him. They say, stay with us. The day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And the scripture scholars say it was that, it was their act of offering hospitality that kind of began to open their eyes. And then it says, when he had seated himself with them at table, and in a sense, this is unusual because in a Jewish home, he was a guest and he shouldn't have become kind of the host. But it says, and it's the exact same four verbs as at the Last Supper, around the bread. It says, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. So he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. And then it says, with that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And the Greek verb there is epigenoskine, which it's much more than our word recognize. So it, they didn't just say, oh, it's yourself. Sorry, didn't recognize you. Sorry. Uh, no, it meant they were deeply bonded with them. In fact, epigenoskine was the, was the Greek verb for lovemaking. Remember when Mary says, how can this be since I know not man? Epigenoskine is the verb there. Whereas, and now they're saying, now they were deeply bonded with them. They knew him in the deep heart's core of their lives. They came to see for themselves. Whereupon he vanishes from their sight. Now, great question. Why did he vanish then? I think his work was done in large part. They'd come to see for themselves. I think he, 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 uh, he it, so that's one possibility. Uh, where did he go when he disappeared? I think he came to Dayton. I think he went to another Emmaus Road. A young uh, student asked me one day, Professor, did this ever really happen? I said, regularly. Happens all the time that we meet him along the way and he meets us and this is how he's present with us. The best answer, I think, to where did he go, uh, Richard Dillon, a great scripture scholar, wrote a dissertation on this text, says he disappeared into them, into us, into the body of Christ. So this, is, this is where it goes on. And it continues because what he started in those gospels continues now through us, through the church, through his body present in the world. Ah, and now they get up immediately. Now you see they've got to go back to life because he brought them from life to faith. But have you ever come to see for yourself? You can't just toddle on home. You have to head back to Jerusalem. So they turn around, they get up and they say, oh, weren't our hearts burning inside of us as he explained the scriptures to us upon the road? In other words, the catechesis was important on the road. The catechesis was important. And yet they came to know him at the table. So they get up immediately, they return to Jerusalem, and the scripture scholars say it would have been a hazardous journey at nighttime. But if you ever come to know your faith that way, you almost have to go share it, evangelize it, put it out there into the world. They go back into Jerusalem, and I love how the Jerusalem Bible translation ends this text. It says, they went back into Jerusalem, they're greeted with, the Lord has been raised. It is true. He has appeared to Simon. So it's official now. Now, why didn't they believe the women when the women came back from the tomb? Huh? And if you look at Luke chapter 1 to, to uh, chapter uh, 24, 1 to, tw uh, to, to, uh, 1 to 12, in other words, the text just before this text, uh, you'll see that they bathe, the women came back from the tomb saying he's risen, and the men dismissed it as idle women's talk. So, but now Peter, Peter has seen it, and so it's official, and uh, our church goes merrily on 2,000 years later. And, but God is not finished with us yet. Uh, I'm convinced of that. God is not finished. They return to a renewed and a deepened faith. But I love the translation. They say, the Lord is raised. It is true. He's appeared to Simon. But then it says, and then they told their story of what had happened on the road and how they came to know him in the breaking of the bread. 
So their story of what, and they went on telling their story. And in many ways, that's what we've been at ever since, trying to tell our story, his story, and trying to get people to put them together, to bring their lives to their fate, their fate to their lives. It's a great idea. For reflection and conversation, what do you think is the potential of a life to faith, to life approach, to, to Catholic education in general, but especially to religious education within our schools? And then are there some decisions that you might make in light of this conversation presentation? Let, well, don't you take a minute at your table with a neighbor and say whatever it is that's occurring to you, what are you coming to see for yourself? Like those two characters in the road to Emmaus, Take a minute or two with a neighbor, and then we're going to invite our learned panel to tell us what they are coming to see for themselves and how they're responding, and, and other ideas and corrections and additions and subtractions to what I've been rambling about. So, why don't you go to work with a neighbor, have a little chat for a minute or two, we'll come back and we'll lead off with our panel. Thank you very much, Susan. I want to give a little idea about the potential of life to faith and faith to life in maybe just a different uh, look. One of the things that I dearly love about my job is going around, visiting your schools, your parishes, and seeing the good and wonderful work that all of you do. Now, I was laughing the other day, I think, uh, maybe I only get invited to your schools because they're wonderful. Nobody invites me to see a tragedy. But, but nonetheless, you know what I, what I want to say that loops, I think, to this question is we somehow have fallen into um, a way of speaking about our schools. I can understand how we got there, but I think this can help us get out of it. Very often someone will say to me, we really do a great job with Catholic identity. Our religious ed programs are wonderful. We do this, we go to mass, we have stations across, and they go on and on and on about this wonderful, wonderful Catholic identity and how they're doing such a good job. But they kind of then just sort of give a little nod to the academics. On the other hand, I have been at schools where they say, boy, our academics are outstanding. Our test scores are spectacular. Our blah, blah, blah. All our kids get into Notre Dame, to Harvard, to Dayton, whatever. Boston College, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for reminding me that. And, and the apex of all, of course, would be Boston College. But it's kind of like, and oh yeah, by the way, we're Catholic. So we've, we've set up this kind of artificial wall between the academics and religion. And that, this keeps reminding me, and some of the things Tom said earlier, how unnecessary that is. Because if we look at life to faith, faith to life, furthermore, if we look at everything God made is good, that there is, then we can start seeing God in everything. We can figure out how to get rid of that division between the sacred and the secular and find new language to talk about what we do in an integrated way of fullness so that when we talk about um, educating the whole child, we can talk about ourselves as offering the fullness of education to students. So that's one thing that I wanted to say about faith and life. It's all together. It's all from God. It's all good. It's all wonderful. Okay. Our Dean, Dr. Kevin Kelly. So, so this is really fun, right? You get to follow Dr. Groom and then <laughs> Karen Bristow, president of NCA, and then, you know, um, so, but uh, it has been, for me, as, as a participant today, really an inspiring day, and I think we've all come from our life to a time and a venue and a space where we've got to um, uh, share faith and think about education in a shared faith environment, which has been uh, enriching and nourishing and, and really um, 
really a refreshing experience for me. So when I think about now going back out to life as a person who's a dean of a school of education and allied professions, you know, what we do is we, we train people for professional roles. And so there are a few things that I want to share with you as um, impressions that were made on me during the day, and, the, and there were three things. One, there's a, a focus, I think, that I want to share with you, and the second thing is I think I got some affirmation from what I saw and heard today, and of course there's always challenge and, and thanks to give. Um, as far as focus goes, our, our bread and butter is training educators, um, and that goes back to the, the roots of the Marianists and back to France, and uh, this university started at St. Mary, as St. Mary's Institute, and so we've been doing uh, teacher education along with education for a long, long time. Um, but as we think about going out and being Catholic educators, I think that uh, in preparing people for those roles, a few things that we have to really increase our focus on is, number one, getting even better at teaching children uh, of poverty, because uh, so many of you work with children and from families that are really economically challenged, yet we have 13 brief years to provide them with an education. They're not going to get a second chance. So we can't really use excuses about too poor, too many obstacles. We, we have to make the most of the time that we have. And so in our school, we have to work even harder at preparing our teachers to go out there and, and know what it's like to succeed with poor children and their families. Along with that, I think we have to really get better at cultural difference. So I went to the family cafe presentation and there were ground rules for the evening. Of course you're used to things, uh, ground rules being uh, printed, listed in English and Spanish, but there's also Turkish. And then there could have been African languages posted also. So we have a, you know, there's a lot that's expected of educators, but I think that we have to understand the backgrounds that our children are coming from, the many different stories, the many different places that they've come to, to get to, to Dayton or to Louisville or to Milwaukee or Cincinnati or Centerville or wherever it is we happen to have our schools and as, as uh, professional preparation specialists, we have to do an even better job with cultural difference. And the same thing with language difference. We can't wait till our students know how to speak English well. They have to be able to learn as they're learning English. So for, for as a dean and for our department chair, and I see our chair of our Department of Teacher Education in the back there, Connie Bowman, I know she takes this very seriously also. We have to really make sure that people go out and, and can encounter the, the language difficulties and the language learning challenges that our young professionals are going into. So that's, that's the focus area as we think about going back to life. Affirmation, I'm so happy with the work and just so proud of the work that's been done by uh, Tony Moore it, with, the, with the St. Remy Project and with the Leadership Institute and Tony and Dave did a wonderful presentation on uh, the St. Remy program today because I think we focus on leadership development also and really isn't that a huge challenge for all of us because you know, uh, there is a lot of encouragement because you look around the perimeter of the room, you see a lot of colored t-shirts, and those are our Lalonde teachers, those are our young educators, and we really have to be thinking about how to help them move quickly into leadership positions because we need strong leadership because, as you know, we have very significant challenges. <laughs> but in what we're doing right now that I feel good about, it's working with people to become the spiritual leaders of their schools as they're going about the business of providing excellent academic preparation for all of our students. And I think that's a niche that we've found and we want to share with more people. And so that, that's, a, that's a point of affirmation that I have as well as seeing all these brightly colored t-shirts and knowing that it's entering a community of working with educators like you. We, we, don't, we don't turn people on to Lalonde by ourselves. It's because they know people from Catholic schools, they've worked with people from Catholic schools, they've been in Catholic schools, and they're inspired by people like you, and they want to be one of you, and they want to be one of us as a community. And so I think we can all draw encouragement from that, but think how we all have to work together on promoting that next um, generation of leadership. Now, of course, always, there's the challenge area. And, and when you look 
when a couple of the sessions that were available today, one was about the Family Cafe in Old North Dayton. And it was, to me, inspiring because at their best, universities and schools can act as connectors. And really, we have to be connected because you know children coming into a kindergarten if they haven't had very good preschool environments and early family environments, they're not fully ready to learn. So we can't wait to people, until people get to us so to start with our mission. At the University of Dayton, we can't wait until people are walking onto campus to have them be prepared for success here. But I think that's a really daunting challenge because university has to be connected with the schools, the schools have to be connected with the, the, the early learning community, the early learning community has to be connected to the community. And to me, that's a, a really big challenge ahead for all of us, but we're not going to reach all of our potential. We're not going to get the most out of all the time that we have together with our students and preparing them for the next steps unless we're connected to and informed by all the various constituencies that we have. So that's, those are some of the thoughts, but, but I want to say that I, I really was inspired by the work that's being done uh, by the Old North Dayton Project, working with families that are new to this country and can't speak English and, and saying, we want to help you get your children ready to learn in our schools. It, it, isn't, that, isn't that marvelous? And, and, and it was really marvelous for me to also to listen to the, the uh, Linda Russell from the UCDRC talk about her staff going out and solving problems, helping kids get to school ready to learn, but also within schools, setting up communities where there are peacemakers and there are prevention efforts and, and, and they're removing the barriers to learning. And really, what is better learning? Learning about faith, learning about English, learning about social studies, but you need certain preconditions to do that. So I, I, I want to thank the staff of the UCDRC and Linda Russell for all their leadership in going out and addressing all of those barriers. And, and, but for me, that really comes back as a challenge because I think University of Dayton School of Education Allied Professions, we really have our work cut out for us to con continue to connect, deepen the connections, and grow the constituencies that we connect with in order to do our work. So I didn't get to the second bullet point, and I think you're really going to be happy about that. So, <laughs> uh, and then I think I'm going to invite, just go ahead and invite Karen Hecker to come on up here and offer her reflections. And I get to follow all three of them. <laughs> it's a big job. Another big job uh, that I've always felt very, very much uh, challenged by is my role as spiritual leader of my school. Um, it's taken on two different a uh, aspects. Uh, my previous school, there was no parish, no priest. So our ministry was uh, extremely focused and very intense. Um, I'm fortunate to be at a more traditional parish school now, but no less focused and intent on my role as spiritual leader. But additional, additionally is my role as academic leader and managerial leader. Um, I have been blessed through the University of Dayton, through the St. Remy Project, through the Center for Catholic Education, through the Urban Child Development Resource Center to hopefully make an impact and do the mission that Jesus sent all of us to do, which he said and told us to pray in the Our Father, to bring about the kingdom. Um, that's always seemed to me to be the most important, important mission statement, and I often wonder why we try to write others, but we do. Uh, but everything we do should be about bringing about the mission, and that was what I saw throughout all the presentations today. Dr. Groom telling us how it's all one. It really isn't separate pieces. Dr. Rousseau telling us, you know, it isn't an academic and a Catholic identity. It is all one. The holistic approach of the Urban Child Development Resource Center, the collaboration uh, that the centers all have to achieve in order to fulfill their missions. Uh, the, the incredible work of the Old North Dayton group, which of course I'm very, very jealous about and would love to just simply jump in right away and have Family Cafe the first day of school, uh, but know that that's not possible. 
but I, the, the theme has been very clear throughout the day, and I really do appreciate as a principal having the opportunity to have a focus on my spiritual side as far as my formation goes, as well as the formation of the staff that I have to work with. Um, they all need it, and we are no longer blessed with the resources that our religious uh, brothers and sisters had at their fingertips in religious communities. We, we have to be more intentional and go out and, and seek those opportunities. And I know uh, one of the other principals mentioned we need to have someone like Dr. Groom speaking to our teachers and inspiring our teachers. But in the meantime, we have to do it. So it's a, it's a big job, and I certainly admire all of the principals, but I mostly admire my teachers. I hope someday I can aspire to be as dedicated as they are in dealing with that. And I hope to take some of this back to my teachers to remind them when their patience is short, uh, when they are ready to uh, devolve and escalate, as they say in the counseling profession, uh, that, that just take a step back and remember why we're here and whose footsteps we are walking in. Thank you. Karen is principal at Immaculate Conception School in Dayton, and we are most appreciative of your um, words. Uh, she's always been an inspiration to me. Um, we would love your feedback. We only have Dr. Groom till 4 o'clock, correct, Dr. Groom? So um, we have a roving mic. If you would like to ask a question, make a comment, we asked you to kind of think about things as you went through the day, uh, we will bring the roving mic to you um, if you would like to share something with us. Perhaps the, uh, the answers to the questions Dr. Groom pr proposed. Come Holy Spirit. I happen to know this participant. Sheila Heaton is our one of our little <laughs> teachers. Um, I just have a question for Dr. Groom. Um, in schools that may have lost sight of their Catholic mission or vision, if you're a you know beginning teacher or somewhere who's not high up on the totem pole, what would be one of your suggestions for revitalizing that mission and that vision in that school? Um, great question. Um, well, you know, wonderful days like today help, but then replicating them within the school itself. You know, I was at, um, at uh, Tony and Dave's workshop on leadership, and I loved what they're doing with integrating educational, uh, managerial, and spiritual. And in a sense, uh, the principals, the leadership of our schools need all three of those. Uh, but I suppose, and this is, of course, a biased opinion, I suppose the spiritual defines the rest. Uh, if we're going to call them Catholic schools. And I, I don't see it as rocket science, really, to be able to take young teachers into our schools and to nurture them in this kind of spirituality of Catholic education. Call it a philosophy if you prefer, if people might, not, might find that a more friendly term, but really it is a spirituality that we're trying to nurture them in. And I don't think they have to be card-carrying party members. Uh, to embrace a Catholic philosophy of education. I had an extraordinary experience that really in many ways has defined my life, although it was very brief and just for three weeks, but very intense. Some years ago, uh, 10 years, 12 years ago now, in, um, in Pakistan. And I spent an intense time there doing workshops, and I discovered this extraordinary Catholic school system in Pakistan of over 500 Catholic schools. And the, the wealthy, powerful families of Karachi would do almost anything to get their kids into Jesus and Mary Convent School. And Benazir Bhutto states very clearly in her autobiography that she never would have entered politics, never would have become Prime Minister of Pakistan if she had not gone to Jesus and Mary Convent School. Now, it is my base while I was in the country. I was there for three weeks. I gave workshops all over the country, um, including up in even Lahore, up in 600 miles north of, of Karachi on the Afghanistan border. And, but what I've discovered in, in, at Jesus and Mary Convent School, where I was based, was that 90% of the faculty are Muslim and 90% of the student body uh, are Muslim. 
and yet they're running a deeply committed Catholic school and a distinctively different kind of school than the traditional Muslim school, which isn't to disparage the traditional Muslim schools, just a different, a different place. Now, Bout, uh, Benazir Bhutto made clear that she got a different understanding of herself as a person, as a woman. She got a different outlook on life. She got a different perspective on, who, on, on other people. She got a d even a different epistemology, a different way of knowing that in a traditional Muslim school, it would have been much more rote memorization. But at Jesus and Mary Convent School, she was taught to think, to question, to probe, to analyze, to assess data, to make judgments, to make decisions. She was taught to think. Now, this is some of this stuff we take for granted. But it's integral. It's constitutive of Catholic education. And these old sisters, a handful of old Jesus and Mary sisters out of Paris, a, that figured out what does it mean to be Catholic. B, that figured out what does that mean for a Catholic school. But C, that figured out how to share that charism with, with, with Muslim teachers without in any way compromising their Muslim faith. And so in many ways, the values that we see and want to epitomize and represent in Catholic education, in fact, they're universal values. Dignity of the person, respect for others, commitment to the neighbor, justice for all. I mean, now, they arise for us out of the gospel and out of our commitment of Christian faith, but they're universal values. So I think it can be done. Now, I lament with all of you the demise of the numbers of sisters and brothers and priests running our schools and so on, but the Holy Spirit, I believe, is calling us to a new day, and I think we can take young people like yourself and indeed uh, set you on fire and give you a fire in the belly for Catholic education. And we do it through student and staff enrichment days, you know, retreat days, Friday afternoons off, uh, whatever it is. I think we can imagine how to do it, and I think it can be done. Sorry for such a long-winded response, but it's a great question. Any other questions? All right. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Groom and our distinguished panel. We'll give them a round of applause, but I need you to stay. <laughs>